Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Despite the fact that most traditionalists look down on everyone else in the church, the fact of the matter is, because of the fact that the other people don't appreciate the tradition or don't have an understanding of it, the fact of the matter is, is that most traditionalists are grossly ignorant of the tradition. Now, they might have a certain sense in which, okay, I'm coming to Mass because I like the old Mass, and they might know certain, you know, aspects of, you know, this is, this is good, we should say the rosary and things of that sort, but when you actually sit down and talk to them and ask them, you know, what do you actually know about the tradition, they usually can come up with nothing. Now, by tradition, I mean the actual, what is tradition? But the point is, I'm not here to beat up on people. What I'm here to say is, is that we should know what we're doing. In other words, we should understand what the tradition is and have a certain sense of it. Tradition, and so for, in order to get a grasp of this, I'm going to do a series of harmonies on tradition. It's going to be dragged out quite a while, but I think it's well worth it. Tradition is part of the deposit of faith and is the means of transmission of that very deposit. Now, what this means is that there's a twofold aspect to tradition. First, the thing that's passed on. Okay. That's called the deposit of faith. It's the thing that's passed on. The second thing is the mechanism or the means by which that is passed on. Okay. So when you talk about sacred tradition, it encompasses the thing passed and the, per the, the mechanism that is passing it. Okay. The thing passed, okay, the expression occurs, that is, the positive faith, occurs in two letters of St. Paul in connection with the idea of doctrines of the faith. The deposit, which St. Paul transmits to his faithful collaborator, is the whole of divine revelation made up of the dogmas of the faith, so in other words, the teachings of the church, Christian morals, so in other words, there's a coherent Christian tradition regarding morality, the sacraments, Holy Scripture, and the hierarchical constitution of the church. The juridical act concept of the deposit requires that it is not the property of the guardian. In other words, it's not the person who receives it that has ownership of it, but of the consigner who has handed it over to him to keep it in a safe state. The deposit of faith has come from God and is entrusted to those to whom a special assistance of the Holy Ghost is assured, that is, to those who succeed the apostles in their magisterium and in their ministry. Christ has transmitted the deposit whose content cannot be subject to alteration. So God, that is Christ, transmitted the deposit to the apostles, and then they pass it on from generation to generation, unaltered. The Church finds in the deposit of faith the riches that she communicates to her children, the arms which she fights her adversaries. Okay, so it also includes the ability to combat certain things. The deposit of faith is something given trotere, the Latin trotere in Latin means to hand over, to give over, to pass over um, to somebody else, from which we get the word traditio or tradition. So the deposit of faith is something given by Christ that is God to the church, or more specifically, to the apostles. So it's the apostles who received it, which means they have certain rights over it. Even though they don't own it, they have certain rights over it. And that will become very important later when we talk about the sacraments and whether they should be used outside the church or not. Second, they, that is the apostles, nor their successors are permitted to change it. And this is where we run into a few problems with the certain members of the magisterium who feel that even the deposit of faith is at their discretion. There's a certain Hegelian dialectic. You don't know, need to know what that means. But it basically just indicates that things always change and that things cannot help but change. And so they think that even the deposit of faith changes and that each generation has successively modified it slightly and passing it on to the generation, leaving part of itself into the next generation. This is absolute heresy. The deposit is the property of Jesus Christ and therefore no one, not even the Pope, has the right to change it. The Pope is merely the custodian of the mysteries of God, that is, the deposit, not the owner. And as a custodian, he or anyone else is not permitted to change it. Now, there are some things about tradition that are open to change, but those don't pertain to the deposit, and some that aren't. That we'll talk about much later. But as to the deposit of faith, these, the, those teachings which were essential to salvation and all the sacraments and those things, the Church does not have a right to modify it. Not necessarily the ritual, but at least the content. Third, the deposit of faith includes several elements. That is, the dogmas of faith, morals, the sacraments, Holy Scripture, and the hierarchical constitution of the Church. The deposit of faith is what Christ left us. 
He left us the sacraments with the apostles, apostles, principally by means of the reception of holy orders. So the principal way in which the sacraments are passed on from generation to generation is by means of holy orders. If the sacraments are not part of the deposit of faith, which is the essential and intrinsic object of tradition, then the transmission of the sacraments from generation to generation would not enjoy the infallible guarantee of the Holy Ghost. Now, what does this mean? Well, this is where we know the state of the contest are in fundamental error. Because it is not possible for the Church to promulgate invalid sacraments in the Pope. It cannot promulgate invalid sacraments because that goes contrary to the very nature of sacred tradition. So, this is part of the fact that even though, and this is something that you're starting to see more and more, there's groups that are outside the Church who claim they're the real tradition. We'll see how that's just utterly absurd a little bit later. But the point is, is that there's an infallible guarantee that the sacraments will be transmitted from generation to generation. It doesn't mean that certain people aren't going to do something stupid and cause them to be invalid. But the Church as a whole transmits it from generation to generation. Also, a part of this is the hierarchical constitution of the Church. Now, the hierarchical constitution includes things like being able to fight our adversaries, the power of exercising the devil, the power to bestow blessings, and things of this sort, which is part which the hierarchy actually has, by means of holy orders and otherwise, by jurisdiction. But the hierarchy means there's also a hierarchical structure of the Church, which is again where the state of the contests are fundamentally in error. If there's been a pope, if you go more than a generation without a, without a pope, there's not a principle of unity for that generation. That means that the hierarchical structure of the church has collapsed and the gates of hell have in fact prevailed against it. It is not possible for the hierarchic structure of the church not to be passed on from generation to generation, and that includes the papacy first and foremost. To hold that there's not a pope is nothing short of a damnable error. It's heresy. Tradition is normally divided into oral and written. Insofar as the things which are handed on from generation to generation are passed on either in something written, that is scriptures, or orally, that is the transmission of the priesthood by means of the form of the sacrament during ordination. In the beginning, the entire deposit of faith was passed on orally for about a generation or so. Hence, the Protestants who say only scripture, or that you have to read scripture in order to be saved, are in error. Because then that would mean that immediately after Christ, the means of salvation weren't passed on, and therefore we have an entire generation immediately after Christ that could not be saved. That's absurd. That means that Christ fundamentally failed in his mission. Not to mention the fact that literacy is something that really only became common in various countries, in the last 150 years, which means you basically would have generation after generation after generation that never read scripture and therefore we, 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 we couldn't be saved. That's absurd. Tradition of the positive faith is not subject to change. The positive faith will always be passed on to each generation. Not that everybody in each generation is going to get the whole of it. Or that they can't, that some people in a particular generation, even members of the magisterium, can't lapse into error. This comes from the fact, however, that the sacred tradition in the Church enjoys God as its cause of inerrancy and changelessness as to the fact that it will always be passed on intact. You know, sometimes you get traditions that get hopeless. Well, I'm sorry, but the reason God has allowed the Church to give as bad as it has, I'm convinced, is to let people know that it doesn't matter how bad it gets, it will still remain intact. Traditions which come from a human cause Human care and human industry do change. Any kind of tradition to be an authentic tradition, not merely really in the sacred sense, but even in the profane sense, is done as a means of passing on esteemed what is good. In other words, tradition is something that we're passing on from one generation to another. If something is truly good, we don't want to mess with it. We want to give it to our children so that they have what we have. But there was an unfortunate generation sometimes called the greatest generation, which decided that it wasn't going to pass on the tradition intact. And it was because they did not appropriate the suffering that they went through during the Depression and the Second World War. So they would refused to deny themselves and their children after that nothing. They begot the hippie generation. That meant that they 
capitulated their authority, and authority is a necessary thing to pass on the tradition. They decided to modify everything in the church. There's literally nothing they cannot leave alone. It's almost a sign of a compulsion. I mean, I hate to say that from the pulpit, but it's true. They can't leave anything alone. It's a sign of a moral problem. Whereas a person, a true traditionalist, he doesn't care about himself. He doesn't care how he feels about the thing. He just wants to make sure that what God wants passed on, the good things are passed on. Sacred tradition is not only a fact of history, but it is a matter of divine law. The divine law to pass on the tradition was given to the apostles when Christ said, Go teach them all I have commanded you. This law is given with the provision of a special institution, the Roman Catholic Church, which God set up to guarantee that the tradition would be passed on intact. And then God constituted an authentic organ of transmission, that is, the means within that church, and that is the Church of the Magisterium. And then he gave it a promise of perennial assistance. Perennial means perpetual. It's never going to end until Christ returns and then he resumes visible headship and then it doesn't matter anyway. That is, the Holy Ghost protects, guides, and guarantees the passing on of what is necessary for salvation. The gates of hell will not prevail. doesn't mean it doesn't look like it. Sometimes the time it starts looking pretty bad, but it's always going to remain intact. Without tradition, revelation could not be preserved, and subsequent generations could not thereby be saved by the knowledge and the means of the positive faith. If a single heresy corrupts the virtue of faith, and, you have, a, a, and the subsequent generations are past um, just heresy, that means none of the subsequent generations could be saved, because you have to have faith in order to be saved. Therefore, a sacred tradition needs an unfailing means by which the things of tradition are passed. That means, is, that means is necessary so that dogma remains incorrupt despite our human condition. That is, we don't get things right. You know, there's that thing, that game called telephone, where you tell each individual, it goes around and around and around. By, by the time you get to the end, it's completely alterated. Well, this is one of the signs that the sacred tradition is divine, because it's been passed on for 2,000 years intact. And God also set up an authentic organ of tradition, which was instituted by Christ, namely the Church, especially the hierarchy, with which he promised to be with, with until the end of time. The tradition is a continual preaching from age to age by the apostolic successors under the charism that is a gift, and of an ability of some sort, a gift, a talent, of assistance of the Holy Ghost, of the revelation by that son, by Christ himself, and first received oil by the apostles. This means that tradition is first and at root an oral tradition, not a written one. Some things are written down, but even those only have a guarantee orally by the church, and this is where the Protestants get it wrong. Somebody has to give witness to the fact that scripture is authentic, and that authority, that's that witness, has to come from some authority. Well, I'm sorry, but a human authority doesn't suffice. Some guy who's decided to hang his shingle up and call himself reverend doesn't suffice. It has to be someone who Christ said, you're the authority, you're who I'm entrusted with this, and you are to pass it on to each generation, and they receive that same authority. And then we receive from that authority the guarantee that these things are in fact true. The contents of scripture, we could not be, have any guarantee unless the church herself was to guarantee it. The requirement to teach, pass on, trot away, the teaching of Christ was manifest when he said, Go, therefore, teach ye all nations. That means everybody is to be proselytized, prudence being observed, of course, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. The apostles are the Gerardians, and the faithful dispensers, not inventors of the doctrine of Christ. And the apostles and their successors are to conserve the doctrinal integrity of the teachings of Christ. Teach all, well if you change it, you're not teaching at all. Teach all that I have commanded you. Therefore the apostles and successors are not allowed to substitute Christ's teaching with their own teaching, or the institution of the organ of tradition was, and, and, and the institution of the organ of tradition was given an indefectible charism namely magisterial infallibility. This charism is necessary to know without doubt, that is, with being assured that there's no error, what Christ taught. And even scripture, as I mentioned, cannot be guaranteed without a continual tradition informing each generation that it's true.
the charism of indefectibility, that is, that the church will not fail, applies to that, applies to all that is contained in tradition, namely the teachings, that is, the knowledge necessary for salvation, the sacraments, the organ of tradition itself, the magisterium, the magisterial offices are passed on from each generation. The institution of the organ of tradition was not done in a haphazard manner. Christ knew what he was doing, and he did it in a very specific way. But he did it in an oral way, which constitutes a perpetual living preaching. This is also necessary since, again, we cannot be assured of the truth of Scripture or even of the documents of the Magisterium without the subsequent generation assuring us of their, the subsequent generation of the Magisterium assuring us of their authenticity. The institution of the order of tradition is indivisible in itself. That it is, it's rooted in the mark of unicity of the Church. In other words, there can only be one Church which can have the ability to transmit indefectibly. No other church, no other religion can and does this without error creeping in. In fact, I mean, this is, is it's a visible structure as well, since the church is a visible institution. Those who cut themselves off from the church are no longer part of the organ of sacred tradition. This applies to schismatics, uh, and it applies to not just, not just those who everybody agrees are schismatics, like the Orthodox, but we're talking about, because of the history of it, the history of it, but those who are under excommunicable sentences are also subject to this, which means once they become excommunicated, it does not matter what their subjective state is. It's irrelevant in relationship to the actual passing on of being an official part of the organ of tradition. Any bishop who is subject to the excommunication of the Holy Father, it doesn't matter what a cardinal says, it doesn't matter how many books are written on it that they didn't incur it, it doesn't matter. The public judgment of the Church is levied by the Holy Father. He determines who is part of the magisterium, and therefore if that sentence is levied, they are cut off from the official organ of the Church, which means they are no longer part of the tradition of the Church, period, until they come back in and get reconciled. The fact that schismatics, as a general rule, normally lapse into heresy within 100 years of their separation from the bark of Peter. It usually doesn't take longer than that much. doesn't take even that long. Since they have cut themselves off from the order of tradition, which enjoys the charism of infallibility, there's no guarantee of their doctrinal interpretations of things. This is something that has to be kept in mind. There's no guarantee that they will pass on the teachings of Christ in their integrity. So what's all this mean? Well, it means the same union with the Church. But it also means to have great hope and trust in God at the fact that he will always pass on intact, make sure that it's passed on intact, the tradition of the church. And from that we have hope and gratitude, but in the end, in these times particularly, peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen.